So may I say it's great to be here, but can I have the Fat Boy Slim intro next time, please? Um, and definitely not Nut Bush. Uh, look, it is great to be here. And um, scary fact number one: the first Esri conference I actually remember part of uh, was 30 years ago. Uh, so I've been around a while, and I just want to say that the thing that's really held true in that time is the is the outlook that spatial information and the people who work with it have a major role and a major impact in society. And that's continued, that one has played out, uh, and we're still just scratching the surface of the iceberg. My job here today is to tell you a little bit about um, Geoscience Australia's role in helping the Australian Transport Safety Bureau in the search for MH370. Um, this is a, a story that starts with tragedy. We lost three, 239 people. Um, in uh, 2014, when this aircraft went missing, uh, my current C pre then CEO, Dr. Chris Pygram, picked up the phone to the head of the Transport Safety Bureau and said, this looks a bit tricky, we know a bit about boats, do you want some help? Uh, and the response was a fairly emphatic yes. And that led to a three-year relationship between GA and um, an exemplary public service organisation, the ATSB. Um, the work we did to support this was pretty diverse. A hundred or more people within GA were involved. I had the honour to, for some of it to happen in my branch, a fair bit of it, but I didn't do the, the work. Um, the name I would mention is Megan McCabe, who is our key GIS person in this role. It went from contractual support, how do, you, how do you contract a major ship to do this work? What are the technical specifications you put around the, the work packages? Um, quality assurance and quality control of the data coming in. Um, interpretation of the data, about what features are being seen, managing the data, uh, advising the ATSB, providing logistic information for the, the way in which the ships were deployed, visualisation, helping to communicate with the media, um, even reinterpretation of satellite imagery to see if we could actually see debris in it. Uh, so all those things had to happen. They happened in two phases. The phase, the search was basically in two phases. Phase one was uh, mapping the sea floor with sufficient detail that you could actually operate in it. Uh, and phase two was only possible after phase one, which was to send down underwater um, towed vehicles which would scan the ocean floor, close to the ocean floor, looking for debris. So going back a step, the, the aircraft took off at 12.40 in the morning. Uh, it flew for an hour on course uh, and then it made an unscheduled U-turn. Uh, stopped listening to the ground control uh, and then was trackable by radar through to the Straits of Malacca, after which it disappeared. So from this point on, there's no data that put an XY coordinate uh, on the aircraft. But the aircraft had um, Rolls-Royce engines on it and every hour those engines send a ping, a health check to the Inmarsat satellite capabilities and by very cleverly working through the that data, it's possible to work out how far away the aircraft engine was from the satellite at a particular point in time. And so there were six pings and there was a seventh ping and that was the last one the engine gave. Uh, and so that gave rise to something called the seventh arc, which is this line here, the pale, the blue line, uh, which is the, the location at which the engine was and therefore the aircraft at the time it ceased operating and presumably hit the ocean. Um, a search ensued, of course, 52 days, 36 vessels, 35 aircraft looking for debris, looking for the black box, look, hoping for survivors, um, and all that was without, uh, without its success, obviously. So then we moved into a refinement of, the, uh, of that arc. So a reanalysis of the, the data from the aircraft and a bunch of scenarios around if the aircraft went certain directions, had certain, went at certain speeds, given the total amount of fuel on board, where might it have ended up on the seventh arc? And so that defined, if you like, the haystack in which the needle lies. And that's a 1.2 million square kilometre area. Uh, Australia, for context, is 7.6 million square kilometres. Um, it could have landed anywhere in that space. It's also conveniently... 12, uh, 200, 2,000 kilometres offshore uh, in some of the roughest ocean in the world. We had no uh, illusions as to how difficult this is. 
uh, the, the, there was an aircraft in 2009 that took off from South America, an Air France flight that went down in the Atlantic. Uh, it w w they knew exactly where that hit the ground, hit the ocean, uh, and went uh, looking for it straight away. It took two years to find it. So this was always going to be an extraordinarily difficult task. The um, Tripartite uh, Joint Operations Committee, which is Australia, China and, and Malaysia, um, worked out that the priority area to look was this 60,000 square kilometre area within the, um, within the possible sites, uh, and that the phase one of the search should, should start there. So phase one is about mapping the ocean with sufficient accuracy to be able to put an underwater vehicle, vessel, vessel in there. Um, and this is the, the previous bathymetry of the ocean. It goes from about 2,000 metres down to about 6,000. That's actually inferred by satellites. The, the satellites don't see the bottom of the ocean. They see the top of the ocean. And, and based on how that varies, you can infer what might be beneath it. Uh, it's not very accurate. So phase one was running ships across all this area uh, that used multi-beam sonar to map the bottom in higher resolution. So we come up with about 100 times as much detail. The increase in vertical accuracy, there were places where that changed by 2,000 metres, two kilometres in vertical depth in terms of accuracy. So this detected features and, uh, that nobody knew existed before. And geologically, it's incredibly interesting. Ah, oh, one button. Ah, over the period of the of the two years, um, we mapped phase one mapped all this data. So we started with the sixty thousand square kilometres, ended up capturing three hundred thousand square kilometres of data in the search area. But two really other important things happened um, that actually flick back to one of the earlier speakers. Uh, on day one, when we were contacted to be involved, we said to the Transport Safety Bureau. We'd love to help, but as a, a government science agency, we use open data. For us, for it to make sense for us to be involved in this, we want the data at the end of the day to be free and open so that we can use it for science and share it with others and it can have secondary value to fishers and others. Uh, and they came to the party on that and agreed to negotiate that with the, with the other countries. And the, at the end, when the search was over, we'd be able to release the data. So that was a major step for us and completely off not what you'd expect as a default. The other thing we did was indicate that there's no, a lot of time in here is actually transit. So all these, these are the ships going to and from the search site. Uh, so why not turn on the multi-beam systems whilst you're doing that uh, and let's take a different path each time. And that actually captured 400,000 square kilometres of data. Uh, and again, that was a, oh, that's a good idea. Didn't think of doing that. Um, so we change the culture in the way these things are done, done, and I'll come back to that a bit later, and ended up with a very large data set of the ocean floor that's never been mapped before. What that phase one indicated was that there's some really significant issues for phase two in terms of underwater sea mounts that are a kilometre tall, uh, fractures that have a 900 metre uh, wall inside of them, um, very rough terrain, things that are really interesting to geologists, um, but not so good if you're trying to tow a towfish 100 metres above the ocean floor and find debris uh, that may be lying in a crevasse. So this really highlighted the, uh, the challenges that faced phase two. Um, we also did, this is a little bit of an aside, as well as mapping the depth, we looked at the, the backscatter intensity, that's the, the backscatter from the multi-beam and how intense it is, and looked for anomalies in that that might occur might be identifiable um, or would correspond to wrecks or, um, or other debris fields. But it, that wasn't really of sufficient resolution from the sea surface to pick up anomalies. So phase two was where the real game was, which is how do you, which is actually towing um, a, an underwater towed vehicle, if you like, um, about 100 metres from the ocean floor. Uh, on a cable, which is about nine kilometres long or ten kilometres long, in water that's 2,000 metres deep in the shallow parts and 6,000 in the deep parts. So this is the reason that you need to know whether or not there's a seamount or a cliff coming up, because steering that thing and getting it to respond in a reasonable amount of time is, as you can imagine, not that easy to do. Uh, they only crashed it once into a muddy sea mountain, we think, um, and they recovered it. So 
So phase one was very, very effective in that, in that sense. Um, we then moved on to phase two. Phase two was big ships out. There were six ships used in this search altogether, uh, sometimes three at a time. Uh, they were mostly Fugaro ships. They were out in some of the roughest waters in the world. I don't know what a 24-metre swell looks like, um, but it's probably pretty scary. This, this, uh, these are shipping containers in the bottom of this, in this, uh, this uh, hold here, and the wave has just broken over the side. It's probably not a good place to be hanging out. Um, there's probably not too many photos of the 24-metre swell either, for various reasons. So this was an epic undertaking. People in Fugaro, there was 100 people or more in Fugaro working on this, uh, and everybody bonded to the task. Uh, what the towfish were doing was scanning the bottom and producing, producing data that looked like this, and the, they were tested. So four test targets were thrown off, were built and then put in the water off Perth, and before the deployment, each tow vehicle was tested to make sure it could pick up every one of these from a one-kilometre distance. And so that was the pass-fail for the suitability of the equipment. Uh, and then the various vessels were deployed. So we're getting now into a point where we talk about the logistics. And this map kind of indicates that there's a fair bit going on uh, in terms of different vessels doing different things at different times. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how the GIS work that Megan did particularly supported that logistical effort. Uh, and, as the, and through time, the search area kind of matured from up here down to here, um, and that had to be adapted to. So as data were captured in these swaths, uh, those came in, possibly two ships working a day, possibly six gigabytes of data per day. The first thing that had to do was somebody had to look at it, identify the footprint, uh, that became part of the statistics about how much was covered. It became part of how much work was done that the pay contractors got paid for uh, and it had to be quality assured. Then the, in the quality assurance, uh, an expert person went forward and, and uh, looked at every path to see that there weren't gaps between the passes and then to pick out these gaps where, where the data weren't very good because in these cases it's on the downhill side of, uh, of, of an occlusion of some form. The great thing about working with multiple, with different communities is they have different terms. So the transport safety bureaus came up with the term that, guys came up with the term that these are data holidays. In, a, in the US that's a data vacation people, but data holidays is where the data have just gone on holiday, so they're not there. Uh, and they, had to, they, they agreed very early on that these had to be revisited uh, the team picked up 23,000 data holidays uh, that had to be retracked at some stage later. The second task of the, as the data came in was to actually look for anomalies. So whether an anomaly that looked particularly outstanding might be something like this, which would immediately be investigated as a potential debris site. So here we have um, one site, and the, obviously it stands out. Uh, whoops, wrong button. And a closer inspection by an autonomous underwater vehicle that's taking images reveals that to be a shi shipwreck site. So a different well, image of the same thing, obviously an anchor. That's what it looked like in the side scan. Uh, that's what it looked like as you took a high resolution image of it. The great thing about this was these were uncharted shipwrecks. And as when we saw the first of these, we were just sort of overjoyed, like if we can pick that up, we're not likely to be missing aircraft wreckage. So it gave a lot of confidence that the methodology was going to be effective. If the, if the wreck's there, we would have seen it. <coughs> then you come to the logistics of how do you visit 650 anomalies uh, and actually investigate them all. Uh, so interestingly and surprisingly, and this sort of blew the socks off the transport safety guys, uh, you can use things like ESRI GIS to do network analysis and work out at a cost path and the most efficient way to get through that lot of work. Uh, and so Megan did this stuff, and this saved millions of dollars. Uh, one estimate is it made some of the search 60% more effective, and all that effort then gets fed back into searching more thoroughly, obviously. So that's for the actual ship moving from the, what's that, northeast down to the southwest. Uh, and then in each of those sites, each of those little red dots, so each of those red dots is a search point, um, go to one of those, then you deploy the autonomous underwater vehicle, 
that's going to go down take images. So the white path here is that thing tracking through its optimal path and the little green bars are it stopping and doing a mission. I'm going to take a photograph of these areas. So you get a sense that the, the spatial analysis part of this was really crucial. From the vessels generating incoming data that had to be landed and managed through to assessing how much area had been coverage, covered, um, working out the quality of those things, paying, you know, reporting on the statistics, uh, producing a large scale maps for the media, um, invoicing, or sorry, accepting invoices from the contractors. That all then got fed back to the search operations team, wherever they are. No, my light's gone out. Oh. Uh, and then that went back to vessel tasking. So this is a really vital part of the operation. Um, throughout all that, captured a ridiculous amount of data. Uh, so 700, well, start off with um, the actual shipboard search in the, in the target area, nearly 300,000 square kilometres, another 430,000 square kilometres of transit data, then the detailed underwater survey of 120,000 square kilometres, and then after the official search, this company Ocean Infinity came in and said, we'll test out some new equipment, and they actually did a high resolution survey for the remaining area, which is that part there, um, on a no find, no fee basis, but they got to demonstrate their technology. Um, uh, and they then, I'll come back to that in a moment actually, but they've contributed that data to the international community. So a lot of data got captured, um, even though the, the vessel, the plane wasn't ultimately found. Our final job, which we said we would do in July this year, and we were panicked because we had the Special Achievement Award coming up, and I wanted to know it was actually going to be delivered by the time that happened, was to deliver the data. So we've got over 100 terabytes of high-resolution data, uh, and I think 20 terabytes of low-resolution data from Phase 1 that had to be delivered. So we took on the task of doing that. We put it all on the National Computing Infrastructure, which is at ANU, uh, and it is all fully available. So the way it works looks something like this. Here's a nice kind of overview video. Uh, and this is flying in from the southwest over the um, fracture zones and through Broken Ridge, which is all about how continents form, incidentally. Uh, and then if you go to this site called Oz Seabed, you can actually find the data, and this is how the tools work. Uh, there's a map tool where you can zoom in and identify the project, uh, and then it's a, a sort of clip and ship type option. You can actually access the raw data files uh, or process data files, which are as grids. Uh, there's depth grids, there's backscatter grids, um, and there's they're broken down according to instrument and device and so forth. So here's the how it works. Someone goes in, puts in their email, download sends a link, which I think you click on and then it pulls down the data. But going one step further than just pulling down the gridded data, which is what people are used to in this space, is this, this visualisation, which we can actually provide and visualise the point data. So here we're looking at point clouds, the individual bathymetric sounding points, and we're making those available. And that's, again, setting a, an expectation with the community and, and another level of um, information delivery, which we think is important, but it takes the community beyond delivering uh, gridded data providing everybody access to the raw data. So there's a report on this, the final investigation report of the Transport Safety Bureau, as well as other detailed reports, hundreds of pages on, on how did they refine the search area and so forth. It's a completely open process. Um, we put up a, um, a story map, which I think was the reason we got the SAG award. Uh, it was one of the most popular so story maps last year. And it was fantastic for communicating with the public, the media and stakeholders about, what, about the whole story of the search and it's, it's available in there. Um, but the bottom right hand thing is a, there's a story behind this too. So Ocean Infinity, um, we've contributed all our data publicly, Ocean Infinity have also contributed their data to something called Oz Seabed, oh sorry, Seabed 2030, an attempt to uh, an ambition to map the world's oceans by 2030, supported by the Nippon Foundation. So that's now available. Um, but the community in general is really stepping up to this idea of open data uh, and contributing to this concerted effort. So now we have Fuguro, um, we were talking to them yesterday, uh, in Canberra, they are now providing, when they do 
go from one place to another, their transit data, they capture transit data, which they didn't do before, and then they're feeding their transit data into this uh, shared effort as well. So we're changing the community uh, and we're pushing open data and that's going to enable all sorts of valuable things in the ocean. Uh, and I guess many of us start off spatial careers on land, uh, but what I want to say is have a look at seabed mapping, look to the oceans. There's a lot going to happen offshore in the future. Whether people are catching fish or labeling, laying cables or, or caring about where your territorial boundaries are, a lot of information is incredibly important in the, in the ocean realms. And whilst there may be many marine disciplines, marine biologists, oceanographers, etc., everything they do, what they're quietly not telling you, is incredibly impacted and determined by the seabed. Knowing how deep it is, how rough it is, and how hard it is, is actually a determining factor on many processes. Uh, and that's a spatial problem, so I hope that more spatial people will be getting into the, uh, into the marine realm in future. Thank you very much, and 